Well, hello, everyone. Today, this was a lightning talk. And I thought I don't have to show a demo, and I can chill. But apparently, even if there is no demo, there is always going to be some sort of technical glitch with any talk. So you know, forgive me for that. Now, as Rachel already introduced me, I'm Vino. And I work for this company called Trevers, and we are the creators of LakeFS. And as you can see here, started off as a software engineer, off to data and ML, and now currently I'm a developer advocate at LakeFS. Today, we are going to talk about a Git-like repository for your data lake. Firstly, why do we need a Git-like repository? And second, how can you actually go and implement one for your data lake, right? The narrative flow of this presentation is going to be, what is the basic data lake? Let's just start looking at the evolution of it. Of course, we all use different object stores, be it any of these cloud services or MinIO, for example, as our data lakes. And then we started optimizing our data lakes for different things, right? Like file level optimization, table level optimizations, and whatnot. So we're going to see how. So that's the open office doing its thing. <laughs> So we can see how the table format enhancements were done on top of the existing object stores. And how, on top of the table format optimizations, we are going to do a Git-like repository and implement that. We are going to be literally on an adventure from now. Part LakeFS, part OpenOffice. We'll see how it goes. So basic data lake, like I mentioned before, is built on these object stores where we literally dumped our data from all the different data sources that we've had. And object stores, because as, in the, as you see, we initially just dumped all the files. We didn't care about the format optimization. Some of them CSVs, some of them JSONs, because most of the applications write you know, uh, APIs in the JSON format. And so we just dumped all these files. But the first level of optimization that we did was to actually partition the data files into day partitions and geography and whatnot, depending on our use cases, how to effectively store them. And once you have that, we had this bunch of downstream applications, be it ML, analytics, AI, and whatnot, consuming them from these data lakes, either in a processed format, or we'll see how different level of processing was happening on top of these data files that we had. This is a basic data lake we all are very familiar with. Now, why object store? Because obviously they are great in terms of performance, cost, developer experience, and connectivity in terms of different tools. I don't have to really like, go in detail of these things because we're all data practitioners here. We understand how these object stores are you know, efficient for us to store these huge swaths of data that's coming in. So I'm just quickly like going over this. Cost, obviously, yes, they are like almost five, 10 times cheaper when it comes to like when it compares to the block storage and developer experience is important because like these object stores give us these mature SDKs and different features that enable us to look into these files that are being dumped and make decisions on like how do we store them and how can we optimize them and whatnot right and if you have like look at AWS, for example, it gives you the storage lens where you can actually look at how the data is growing in different partitions and different buckets and so on. And connectivity, obviously, we have all these different data applications, both consumers and producers, having this ability to connect to our object stores, which is why these object stores are prominent, because you can work with literally any data application when you have an object store. And our LakeFS, comes in here as well, because you can, LakeFS also lets you talk to the underlying object store. Now, this is the basic you know, data lake as we spoke about, level zero, everything's fine. Now, the first level of optimization, let's see what do we want to do. The file format optimizations, right? So from the JSON and CSV formats, we moved on to using Parquet as a format because Obviously, it gives us, you know, firstly, it's columnar format, and it's easy for analytical queries because we're always doing aggregations and filtering on top of them. Second, obviously, it gave us like, a highly compressible, like, highly compressible option. And the third is it supported different complex data types compared to the basic files. But only one challenge that we have with the Parquet files, though, is that it still like, operates at the file level or the object level, meaning if you want to, like, 
do any sort of changes, you're doing changes for the whole object. The next level of optimization from the file level was table level, where we created these table level abstractions on top of these files, right? Working with data, traditionally we've been used to treating data in terms of tables thanks to databases. So now creating these table level abstractions, let us talk to the data in the object stores as if they are just tables. So it, naturally making us talk to them in terms of SQL language, making it easy for the data analysts and the practitioners to access the data in, underneath. And now here you can see an example of a Delta Lake table where you have the Delta log and the actual files that are stored on. The good and the bad thing is first, because it's a table, you can have the schema and everything defined, so you can have an expected schema of how the table or the data should look like, making it easy for querying and, use, and to be used by the downstream applications, right? And of course, you can traverse between different versions by snapshotting them at different, you know, uh, but all of this is happening at the table level, right? So you can snapshot them and traverse back in time and whatnot at the table level, making it easy for the consumers, essentially. And of course, we do have the different implementations of that, the popular ones being Hoodie, Iceberg, and Delta Lake, right? So far, we are good. We had a basic data lake. We did a file level optimization, went for Parquet, and then we went one step further and did table level optimization by using these open table formats. And now, let's go even one step further and think of our data lake like a Git-like repository, right? Doing abstractions at the table level was still fine, but then if you think about it, none of our data sets are gonna be just one table or the two tables, right? It's always gonna be like multiple, like tens and hundreds of tables with data sitting inside our data lake. So anytime you want to do the operations, you don't wanna deal with it at the table level, you wanna deal with it even you know, higher level of abstractions, which is where we wanna create these branch level abstractions where the branch contains literally all of the data in your data lake, right? So here, for example, we are doing Git-like branch abstraction where we have main branch and a version one branch, which still contain, you know, same versions of data, but you can access them at a branch level, not the table level. Okay. Again, so we have these object stores and we have branch level abstractions that are created, right? And how can you go ahead and create these abstractions? You can use LakeFS to literally create a data repository, and LakeFS lets you do these branch level abstractions on top of your tables that you already have. And as we see here, now we can traverse among commits because suddenly, because we have these branches in the repositories, the abstraction is at the branch level, so you can do all the Git-like operations, right? Create a repo, create a branch, do all the changes that you want to do to your data, make commits and merges and reverts and whatnot, right? And all of this is happening at a data lake level, meaning you're not dealing with the individual tables anymore. And as you can see, there are a couple of implementations of these as well, one of this being LakeFS and the other being Project Nessie. And let's dive deeper into how LakeFS can you know, help you do this or implement this for your data lake. So here, as you can see, LakeFS sits on top of these object stores. Could be, you know, all the three cloud service providers or even Minayo, as I just talked about before. And what LakeFS does is literally it is sitting as a metadata layer on top of your object stores and it helps you verge in the data through Git-like operations. And with the existing host of applications that are your data consumers, you can directly access your S3 assets in your current setup, or you can access the S3 or these object stores through LakeFS if you want the versioning enabled, right? And if you look at the code on the right side, as you can see, the command and everything is ex like extremely similar to Git in the sense you do a branch create and you have a new branch which is you know, available for you to process the data. And Imagine any time you're trying to adopt a new tool, you're always worried about how much of an interruption it, or an intervention it needs in your existing code base, right? As you can see here, let's assume if your S3 path or a MinIO path, which looks like an S3 path is like at the top, all you need to do is just add a new prefix, which is gonna be the name of the branch that you have, and everything else will work as is, right? 
So with minimal level of interventions to an existing code, you can actually have a data versioning engine sit on top of your object store, and you can do all the versioning operations with a Git-like interface. And like I mentioned, LakeFS offers these, you know, three different types, basically, of uh, interfaces. One is, like, it has the API. You can, like, if you're a Python developer, we have a Python API client, Java, Scala, and whatnot. And it also offers a UI and CLI, as you can see. And one thing that you may be interested is to understand, okay, now, when I am creating a branch, Am I actually going to copy all of the data from one branch into another? Am I going to like replicate my data like, I don't know, n times or 100 times every time you create a branch? Obviously not. That's, effect, like, that's not an optimal way of doing things, at least not at the petabyte scale data lakes that we are working with, right? So what LakeFS does under the hood is essentially copying all the metadata pointers that are pointing to these objects in the object store. So just by copying the metadata, you're able to create a branch. And assume you created a branch and you're working with a new branch. Anytime you make changes, maybe you know, delete a file or even add a file, it is doing a copy on write to write those you know, diffs back into the underlying storage. And as you can see, even in a commit, these commits are essentially pointing to the you know, pointers that are belonging to the same objects. But only when there is a difference, when, maybe when the file is, like a new file is added, it is now going to create that specific pointer corresponding to the new file that is being added. It's just doing a copy on write. So just because it is doing copy on write, what happens is, imagine if you have like a, a, a data lake environment that is up and running, and if you want to create a new test environment, right, all you need to do is just do a branch create, and in a few milliseconds, you have an isolated test environment with access to all of the production data available to you to do all sorts of testing of your data pipelines and run ML experiments and whatnot. But because this branch is isolated from an actual branch, you can have, say, for example, in the main branch, you can have all the production data sitting that is live, you know, serving all the applications downstream. So this main branch is not getting affected when you're like branching out into a test branch and doing all these operations. It is isolated, but it is also not copying the data into the test branch, effectively giving you a zero copy testing environment in a millisecond for you to do these testing and everything else or experimentation with the data. Now, like I said, right, we understood how we can implement the Git-like data operations using LakeFS. So here are just some of the examples or use cases for you to think about how you could do or what you could do with LakeFS, right? You could just you know, traverse among different commits. If you want to reproduce an experiment, you just check out a specific commit, and you, you always have the data readily available for you. So you can traverse among the commits. And the most you know, notorious example being, anytime you have a data error in production, the first thing you need to do is just revert to a previous commit, and you're good to go as good as reverting it in you know, code. Like in the software world, the first thing we do is literally revert to the previous version of the stable software, and we're done. And you can do the same with data, too, irrespective of you know, the petabyte scale or a few terabyte scale of data. And merging two branches gives you this atomic updates uh, option, meaning if you can think about it, if you had multiple updates happen to, a, happen to the data in a branch, you can do multiple commits. But when you're merging, all of these commits are you know, pushed to the main branch simultaneously, giving you that you know, atomic updates option. Like if you think about if you have, let's say, any of the, uh, the previous ones, for example, Delta Lake or Iceberg or Hoodie table format, you're doing all the operations at the table level, right? Because here it is happening at the data lake level, you can have updates happen to different tables. But when you're doing a merge back, so there is cross-collection consistency because irrespective of updates happening to different tables, when you do a merge, updates to all those tables will be atomically updated in production. And this we've already seen, like creating a new branch instantly gives you a new data development environment for you to run experiments or test your pipelines and whatnot. And when you take a commit, you can always check out a specific commit that gives you the ability to go back to a specific data, which means you can reproduce 
any experiment that you've done at that point in time. And the takeaways or the summary, you know, the summary of this would be that just by having a Git-like repository for your data lake, now you're operating at the repository level, not at the file level or the table level anymore. And because we have the size of data that are at the petabyte scale today, it makes sense to have these operations handled at the repository level. And so we do have like a growing and thriving community of open source contributors and users for LakeFS. And th these are some of the you know, data-driven companies that currently use LakeFS as well. And we always welcome and encourage the community to you know, be contributors. So you could, if LakeFS is an open source project, like I mentioned before, so if you're ever thinking about doing a POC, just try your hands at you know, what this can do for you or your team. You can always go check out the docs and like, get started. And we also have a Slack community if you have any questions or any help needed to you know, get started with LakeFS as well. And that's all I have for today. And thanks for being a wonderful audience. All right, any questions for Vino? Excellent. So when you're setting up your whole data lake with LakeFS, like uh -huh. what's the starting point? Like do you just get all your object store locations and decide how you want to in, um, organize that within a Git repository? Is that the starting point? Uh, okay, so I would say the starting point is configuring the LakeFS S3 gateway with your S3 credentials, for example, right? Like you have all your data in an S3 bucket, let's just take for the example. You configure LakeFS to talk to that S3 bucket, and that's all you're doing. You're not moving your existing data into somewhere else to have LakeFS enabled. So LakeFS internally has this S3A gateway, which is capable of talking to any object store that understands S3-like API. So you just configure S3 credentials, like the access and the secret keys with LakeFS, and you're good to go. Yeah, because from what we've seen so far, people create these repositories at the bucket level. So for each of these buckets, you would do that. Hi, uh, my question is uh, about uh, creating the buckets and the sub-buckets. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that uh, we can use it like a git like uh, repository but what is the actual use case for that because either we work on some data all together or we don't do on on the single file level i, I could not visualize it uh, at the for, for example if i'm using s3 mm -hmm. i would partition my data uh, in under different months or different days all together uh -huh. instead of doing it uh, on top of LakeFS uh, thing. So, I mean, if you have to sell it to me, w what is the point for using LakeFS in that case? Okay, if I'm understanding it correctly, let's say if you have all of your data that is sitting in a specific S3 bucket partitioned by a specific column, let's just say date partitioned, yeah. right? You can create a LakeFS repository for that specific bucket. So now you can do the commits and the merges and all the changes to all these files under the bucket, and all of that would be versioned for you. Okay. Is that? Yeah, but you can. You will be doing in S3 if you're doing a versioning of objects in S3. It's literally at the object level, right? So if you're writing a parquet file to a specific partition, if it's going to write 500 parquets, like one table might be written as 500 parquets, and now S3 is going to version each of these 500 parquets separately. Go ahead and, and every time you want to access a specific table, a specific version, now you need to figure out maybe using timestamps, make sure that you know the timestamp of all the 500 parquets are the same when you're reading it. But with this, you don't have to worry about that at all because you have a specific commit, and you go to that commit, and you have a version of the whole S3 bucket at that instant. You don't have to find out a way, either using timestamp or other variables, match all these objects at a specific point in time. Make sense? Thank you. Hi, uh, so on the read path, so if mm -hmm. it's an application trying to analyze a whole bunch of objects, does LakeFS come in the read path at all? 
Yes, it does. Like once you have LakeFS on top of the object store, it goes, you know, the reads and the writes go through the LakeFS. Because otherwise... Just for the metadata or even for the data access? Okay, so there are like two things associated with it. One is, so LakeFS has two uh, gateways. One is the S3A gateway that would let you uh, go through LakeFS for everything, right? So if you're using S3A gateway to talk to the underlying object, all the requests, read and write, have to go through LakeFS to go through the S3. Now, if you don't want that, because S3 might be able to handle you know, the load, but we don't want LakeFS to be the bottleneck, because now suddenly everything has to go to LakeFS, and can it even scale if you have like huge volumes of data? So for that, we also have another you know, like gateway, which is we call the LakeFS Hadoop FS, which would only root the metadata but then the reads and the writes directly happen on the object store. But before that, there is an overhead of reading the metadata and making sense of what branch is at what location and everything that happens only at the metadata level. So you get to choose, depending on the scale of your data, do you want all of them go through LakeFS or do you want only the metadata be managed by LakeFS? Thank you. Actually, I have two questions. So, oh. first one is: Do you have your own, Do you have your own Git implementation? The second one is: What's performance comparing to other uh, storage? Okay, and what was the first question? I'm so uh, sorry. Do you, have, do you are you using your own, you know, uh, Git implementation? Git implementation. Okay. Mm, okay. We don't have our own Git implementation, but what we have is a kind of similar to Git, but just you know, it's designed for scale because Git is not going to work for a petabyte scale data lake. So the, if you look at the internals of LakeFS, it is like the implementation is different from Git. So we don't do anything with Git at all, if that helps. And yeah. Do you have? Yeah, I don't have any performance benchmarks ready for you, but I will definitely get back to you on it. Like there, there are performance benchmarks, but I just don't have the data. My question is, uh, do you maintain a separate meta store or use already a meta store provided in the lake house? Uh, okay, so currently we do have a key value store, which is like part of LakeFS that does the meta store management for us. So we don't use the existing, like for example, if you're using S3, we don't do anything with S3 versioning systems at all. So we do our own metadata management, which is a KV store, which is internal to LakeFS. In the storage, and if, if you can do that, what does that mean for, um, for for that use case? Okay, so let's assume that you have your production data in main, and you're branching out into test branch, and now you've deleted a file. So what does it mean to the files in the main Correct. branch, yes. right? So I did not get into the technical details of it. So what LakeFS offers is it also has garbage collection. So when you are deleting a file, you can decide is it a soft delete or a hard delete. Do you want it to be deleted everywhere, or do you want it to be deleted only on that branch and leave it everywhere else as is? Because when you think about it, when we're doing GDPR, if you do a deletion, sometimes we actually permanently delete the data, right? So we want that ability as well. But ideally, when we're working in a branch, when I say isolation, deleting file in one branch should not affect the file in another branch. So we do have the option you can decide accordingly. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Veena.